How does a filmmaker decide what kind of short to make? You should definitely make something that you want to make. I always say, and this is for shorts and for features, you know, when people say, well, what makes a good film? I always say there's three things. The very first thing is something you want to make. For shorts and for features, you shouldn't make something you don't want to make. You're going to be the prime driver of this and you're going to live with this for the rest of your career. So don't think, you know, horror films are very popular, so I should make a horror film. It's like, no, if that's not who you are or what you want to do, this is the short film is your chance to do what you want to do. So don't sell out because you think you should do that. No, do something you really want to do. So the first thing is make something you really want to make. Then the second part is, is make something that other people want to make. So if you can't convince anyone to star in your short or help you help you know direct it and or, or produce it or act in it or um, you know even crew on it, if people aren't so excited to help you on it, that might be your first clue that this is not something really is ready to be made at this period of time. Um, or maybe you don't have enough money to make it. I know a lot of people who've written short scripts and you look at it and you're like, well, do you have twenty thousand dollars? Because if you don't have that, I don't think you're going to be able to make this film. Again, we're so used to seeing features that do all these incredible things that we it's hard for us to realize, well, yeah, that has budgets of, you know, millions and millions of dollars. So if you wanted to do something that was kind of like that, but only two mil, two minutes long, still, you're going to need a million dollars. So, you know, do you have a million dollars? You got to scale back and do what you can actually physically do for a short film. So something you want to make, something others want to make and is makeable. And then lastly, this is the part that you can ignore or not ignore, but something that other people want to see. So, you know, just because you want to make it and your friends want to make it, it could be that, you know, you're not getting into festivals because it's just not a film that people really want to see. So um, I always uh, say uh, there's a lot of people who make short films about Alzheimer's and I'm always like, oh, another Alzheimer's short. It's a story that they really felt like they wanted to tell and there's a lot of older actors who love to do that film too. And you can get great actors and, and great drama in the story and it really could be moving but we've seen that short over and over and over again. And, you know, in a submission of like 20 short films, two of them will be Alzheimer's shorts. And you're just like, we've seen it. The audience sees, has seen it. It's just overdone. So, you know, there are certain things that are just overdone. It used to be for a while zombie shorts. Like everybody was making zombie shorts, I think because the makeup was easy to do or accessible. And again, there's inherent drama in zombies, right? And maybe that's something people really want to do. They're like, I want to direct The Walking Dead, so I'm going to make a zombie short. And you know, having said that, there's some uh, zombie shorts that I absolutely adore. And people did crazy things with it, like zombie prom. And um, there's a great one called I Love You, Sarah Jane. So there's some that I love as zombie shorts, but there's been a lot of zombie shorts. So, you know, yours has to be different so that people don't be like, hmm, it's another zombie short. Sure. And what was the feature, uh, Alzheimer's feature? Was it away from her? Oh, wasn't it Alice was one too? There's been a lot. Yeah, of... there's been some great features, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I get it. For a short, it might be, yeah. But even now, if you tried to make another feature of that, people would be like, haven't we seen that a hundred times already? Sure, sure. There's certain topics that are just, you know, you could argue universal and always of interest. And again, your specific version of it would make it specific and not so universal. You know, everybody has a different kind of story with it. Um, so in the same way, there's lots of different ways you can do zombie shorts. So I'm not talking you out of it. I'm just saying, by the way, <laughs> there's a lot of that. However, again, like coming of age, aren't there a million coming of age stories? And each one is different and unique. So you should tell your own coming of age story that you really want to tell. And quite often students do, because like what living have they done? Coming of age is all the living they've really done. So go ahead and make a coming of age story. And I, I'm sure it'll be, you know, very moving and touching and something you wanted to make and others wanted to make. There just might be a point where people don't necessarily want to see it because like we've seen a lot of coming of age shorts. Sure. Or, or about like a family member. But I know there was, there's been a few where there was one about a guy whose dad was a musician and he kind of gave it up to raise his kids. And there was a part of him that felt very resentful about that. And it was a great look at how this guy never really got to connect with his dad because his dad always felt like I gave up my art for you. And, and it was the way it was done was, was, I mean, you had tears in your eyes. So that, I love moving short, you know, so as much as I'll try to talk filmmakers out of something like, Oh no, don't do it. We've done none of it. If it's moving, I don't care if I've seen a million of them before. I want to be moved and I want to be touched. And I want to hear a story that the filmmaker had to tell despite a hundred people telling them, don't do it. There've been too many of them or whatever. If you have something passionate you want to say and do, then it'll translate onto screen and we'll see it and be like, wow, even though we said, oh, we've got a million of them, we're only going to show one. We're going to show yours because yours was so fabulous. Sure. And, but then there's a danger and then you could do it. Oh, my uncle Joe's just great. And everyone's like, 
sure, he's a sweet guy, but what's where's the arc here? You know, so th there is, you know, I get. My big pet peeve is endings, that so many people, and this is what turns what was sketches a lot too, that there's just no ending. And with short films, we really are critical about the ending. Quite often there's a big terrific twist at the end that takes you completely by surprise and everything you've seen before you now reevaluate. Um, and those ten, shorts tend to do great because we're not expecting that. Um, but no matter what, there has to be a reason that your short ends at that time and that ending has to feel satisfying to the viewers. So, you know, I think that's where a lot of people fail too, is that just peters out. There's no real ending. There's no last statement or anything like that. Um, it's just like, and it's over. <laughs> Maybe because they ran out of money or because the ending didn't work and they just kind of cut back till they found something they thought could potentially work. But ending is so important. What if someone can't decide whether to make a short film, a feature film, or a TV pilot? So TV pilots, I don't really have much to say on that front because it's not my specialty and it's also tricky in this world. I mean, I think you could make something that other people will say, oh, that could actually work as a pilot for, or a concept for a TV show. So it wasn't like a 22 minute or 42 minute full on legitimate pilot, you know, which again, people are used to expensive uh, stuff on TV. So if you have those, <laughs> if you have those millions sitting around so you can make a pilot that looks like a real pilot, go for it. But you can do a part of it or a little segment of it or a trailer of it to give people an idea of what it could potentially be. But for a short film or for a feature film, um, you know, you can you can go ahead and make it, right? Nobody's going to stop you from doing it. Um, and I, I shouldn't be just say don't do a TV pilot. If you know how to do it, go for it. Do it. Again, nobody stops you. And that's what's so fabulous. It's like if you want to do it and you think you know how to do it, go for it. Totally make it. But I always say too, people can tell. People can tell from like watching two minutes of a 20 minute long film, this person is a storyteller. This person knows what they're doing. And they'll often say, I don't need to see the whole film. I can see that they know, you know how to work with actors, how to deliver moving moments, et cetera. And that can show people, okay, now they're ready to make that bigger piece. So don't feel like you have to do the full length thing to have people appreciate what your talent is or see that there's talent to make you take the next step of, you know, you don't have to make a low budget feature to get hired to make a feature. <laughs> there are many people who've gotten hired to make a feature based on a short film or just based on their script by themselves, you know, by itself that they can be a director for it. Um, you know, I do believe in low budget filmmaking and there's a great, up. No, again, no one will stop you and there, you can make amazing things with a low budget film. But I always think it kind of comes back to money too, you know, no matter how cheap you try to do it, low budget filmmaking for feature, that's a lot of money. You know, it's a, even if you're scraping by with thousands, it's like, do you have thousands? <laughs> you can make a car or, you know, you could buy a brand new car or you could make a feature film that, and people aren't used to seeing so cheap feature films too. That's what's also really difficult. They're used to more expensive films. So sometimes they don't see the value of what you're making when you've done it so incredibly cheap. I would say, you know, a short film that was really short but shows your talent and shows what you want to do is more worth uh, your time and effort and money. And so, you know, again, I don't think you can make a short film for no money whatsoever. You can make a short film for $500. You can make a short film for a couple of thousand dollars. Quite often I teach and some of my students underestimate how much money they have to put into it especially about post. <laughs> now, when you're a film student, you can often get things to help you with, with post, but the difference between something that you just shot on your iPhone with no post and something that you do proper post on, world of difference. So, you know, people underestimate the money that you need for post-production, and then they offer uh, uh, underestimate the amount of money you need if you're gonna send your film off on the festival circuit. That's also not free. <laughs> So all of a sudden it's like, let's say you had $5,000, which I would love to have $5,000 to spend on my art. Um, you know, I'd rather you make a short film for $3,000, including all your posts and save $2,000 to send it off on the festival circuits where you can actually go and attend these festivals and, you know, uh, because they're not going to pay you. <laughs> to if the festival's not in your back door, they're not going to pay to fly you out or put you up, but you may want to do that. And then, you know, you need money to do that. So I would highly recommend when you're budgeting, put money for post and put mon money for festivals if that's something you want to do. What if someone says, I'll do my own post? A lot of people do think they can do their own post because you know that's the miracle of the, the computer now that so many elements are there. And you can, in the same way you can write your own script or shoot your own script. But I always say like, it's a world of difference if you have somebody shoot it, be a DP for you. So why wouldn't you also have somebody edit for you and be there, uh, give their skills for that? And why wouldn't you have somebody do their post-production sound? 
because it's amazing how much post-production sound can add to the production value of your film. Sound is everything. People will forgive things that don't look that great, but if the sound is good, it brings it up incredibly and makes it so much more professional. Um, and a lot of people want to help you. You know, a lot of post-production places, if you approach them and you're only asking for help on a five minute long short and you have time, <laughs> you're like, whenever, if you can do it in your spare time, sometimes you can get professionals to help you on these things for not that much money. Or you pay like a regular client. If you have that money, you can get top not I know a lot of short filmmakers who have Skywalker Sound do their sound. It's doable, you know? So... If you have the money, <laughs> frankly, in filmmaking, if you have the money, a lot of things are possible. That's true. <laughs> but don't skip on post and don't skip on marketing.